Well, let me first, let, let me start by saying that my name is Vladimir Posner. Uh, I am a journalist. I host a weekly interview show on Channel One, but I don't work for Channel One. Channel One buys the show that I produce. So I'm an independent journalist, and there aren't many of us in this country, and there aren't many of us anywhere for that matter. Um, I am someone who grew up in the United States, in New York City. I went to school there. I was born in France. My mother was French. Um, I've been living most of my life in the Soviet Union and in Russia, but I did work in the U.S. for about seven years in the early 90s with Phil Donahue, doing a show called Posner and Donahue. Uh, and um, being who I am, I'm extremely involved in Russian-American relations because I am, I consider myself to be, well, I am an American citizen. I'm also a French citizen, and I'm also a Russian citizen. But I grew up in New York. I was an all, you know, the all-American New York kid. I was a Yankee fan. Uh, I knew Joe DiMaggio. So, you know, for me, America is much more than a word or a concept. In a way, it's who I am. And uh, Russia has become part of me as well. So the relationship between these two countries, for me, has been um, important not just as a human being, because it's important for everybody, really. But it has a very personal kind of importance, which is why I've been involved most of my life in trying somehow to um, support and improve these relations. And that's why I'm talking to you. Generally speaking, the perceptions that Russians and Americans have of each other are perceptions that are created by the media. Um, we, to a very large, um, to a very l a large extent, are victims of our own media. We um, think that we're independent thinkers, but we're really not. Uh, when we time and again hear the same thing about another country or another person, we gradually begin to believe what we hear or what we see, what we're shown, and so on. Um, today, I think that in both countries, in the United States and in Russia, the perceptions are quite negative, um, even more negative than during the Cold War. At least in Russia in those days, there was a clear distinction between the White House, Wall Street, and the American people. And the feeling was the American people are wonderful people, they're like us. Wall Street and, and the White House, uh, that, that's a completely different story. Uh, today in Russia, that distinction is very blurred. Today it's Americans, it's America, and the, um, the anti-American sentiment that one, that one meets in this country, and not only in Moscow, or perhaps less in Moscow, but around the country, is much higher than it was 30 years ago or 40 years ago when citizen diplomacy just began. I would say that in the United States, you have pretty much the same situation. Um, uh, there is a fear of Russia. Uh, the president of Russia, Mr. Putin, is described as a thug, a killer. And um, that's pretty much the picture most people have. So it's a, um, a very distorted picture on both sides. And it's a very dangerous one because it leads to fear. And when you react from fear, you usually react the wrong way. And I can take that one step further and talk about the, uh, the danger of an accidental nuclear exchange when because of that fear, because of mistrust, one side getting a warning that supposedly the other has launched its missiles will immediately counter launch. Uh, we were close to that on many occasions, but what with the situation we have today we're even much closer. And I think that's something that should be kept in mind and looked into. It's going to be very difficult to change attitudes. Um, obviously, for that, the media have to change. And I don't see that changing on either side. Um, media, at least uh, the most influential in this country, is controlled by the government, directly or indirectly. I'm talking about the main television networks. Um, in the United States today, media is controlled by corporations. 
used to be the case when um, a television station, a radio station, a newspaper belonged to a concrete person or a concrete family. Like, for instance, CNN belonged to um, Ted Turner and uh, CBS belonged to Bill Paley. That's all changed now. Uh, these, um, these media outlets are part of much, much larger corporations. And so what you have is corporate policy and corporate censorship, which is absolutely as effective and sometimes even more so than government censorship. So in a way, in a very strange way, the two sides have come together in that you have government control here, which of course exercises censorship, and corporate control there, which also exercises censorship. As a result of which, if you were to go through mainstream media in this country and try to find anything positive about the United States, you probably wouldn't. And it would be the same thing in the United States pertaining to Russia. You know, try to find anything positive in mainstream media about Russia over the past, say, five years. You won't be able to. That is what forms the, uh, eventually, the outlooks in both countries. Uh, there has to be a breakthrough for that to change. There has to be some kind of an outcry on the part of people. Uh, in my opinion, um, your organization uh, alone can't swing it. Uh, there are other organizations in the United States, other groups of people um, who, who are very concerned about what's going on today. And I think you should try to pool your efforts. I think you should bring them all together and not think about who's more important or who's the number one, but rather how do we all get together to start to change views and attract people who are, uh, at this point at least, neutral, that have not taken sides, um, including people um, who are members of Congress, all kinds of people, gradually getting getting that, um, that momentum going. Um, in Russia, it's going to be easier, and I'll tell you the reason why. Um, Russian leadership is interested in improving relations with the United States. Now, it doesn't mean caving in to American official demands, but the Russian side would indeed like to have a partnership with the United States. Now, would the United States like to have a partnership with Russia, I think is a big question. Getting back to Russia. So in this country, if they see that there is an effort on the American side, that there are Americans um, who wish to break through the kind of impasse that we're in right now, you will find in Russia a very receptive um, public to that. Back in the days when citizen diplomacy was just beginning, and it was absolutely an American invention, if you will, and initiative, the Americans were independent people. They were not in any way sponsored or supported by their government. In fact, on the contrary. Now, the people they met with in the Soviet Union, because it was the Soviet Union in those days, those people were either dissidents or close to being dissidents, or they had the government okay, the official okay, to do this. There were virtually very, very little, little independent um, Soviet citizens who would get involved in that kind of activity. Today is a very different kind of situation. Average Russians will absolutely be interested in doing this, provided they believe that on the American side there's a desire to do it. So I think that um, uh, the way to go is to try to bring in more and more people and to work together. You know, there's two ways of looking at your hand. You can look at it as five different fingers or as a fist. And the fist is sometimes more effective because it's all together here. This way, it's, you can break your finger if you try to hit this way, right? So I would look at it at that way. And I would also try to stimulate um, television exchanges, uh, people-to-people -people exchanges um, so that on both sides uh, there is a personal involvement and a personal experience. Uh, once you've had that, then media can't really change reviews. A very important subject today is the danger of uh, an accidental nuclear war. I don't think that most people realize that. 
back at the beginning, again, of citizen diplomacy in both sides, and especially in, in the United States, people were absolutely, um, if you'll excuse my language, they were, sh they were scared shitless of the possibility of a nuclear war. Children were taught to hide under desks. It was a reality. Uh, movies were um, produced, for instance, the day after. Um, there was real concern about the danger of nuclear war. And strangely enough, that's no longer the fact. I sometimes ask myself, why? Is it because um, when it seemed that the, the Cold War was over, everyone heaved a great sigh of relief, and now they don't want to go back to thinking about the dangers of nuclear war? They just push it aside? I really don't know. But the fact of the matter is that it's there. And very soon, some very important agreements are coming up for review, all of which pertain to um, limits on nuclear weapons. What's going to happen with those agreements? Uh, nuclear arms today are far more powerful than they were 20 years ago, let alone 50 or 60. So that's one area, uh, the area of the containment of nuclear weapons and perhaps getting rid of a majority of, of nuclear weapons is, an, is a highly important um, subject. Another important subject is um, making the press accountable for what is said. Uh, journalists should be accountable for what they tell you. Um, and, and, and we all should be able to, to express, um, not even to express, but to expose lies or half-truths that consistently appear on television in both countries, radio and press. Um, I think that, um, that probably journalists or people who call themselves journalists are responsible for much of what is going on today. Now, they have bent to um, the kind of journalism that is demanded of them and it's no longer journalism. It's really propaganda. If I speak of this country, of Russia, I would say it's propaganda both on the side of those who support Mr. Putin and on the side of those who are opposed to Mr. Putin. Because a journalist is not supposed to support or to oppose. A journalist is supposed to furnish the audience with facts, with information, object on information, uh, truthful information, and then say, all right, here it is, you make your own decisions. The press doesn't do that anymore. They keep telling you what's good and what's bad, who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. And I think um, we all should pay much more attention to that. And finally, I would stress the importance of people-to-people um, -people, uh, relations. In a way, this conference will will um, finalize certain things and, and formulate how to move forward. I know that um, this conference, which I can't attend because I'm in the States right now, as I speak to you, uh, I'm lecturing in Monterey and then at Yale University. Uh, the name of the conference is Whom Do We Trust? And it's a very good way of, uh, it's a very good name for a conference. And it is a very big question, whom do we trust? And why? Do we trust who we trust? Uh, it's, uh, it's an issue to give a lot of thought to. Um, and um, I, I hope, that, I hope you're, you're, you're able to grapple with that question. At least I, I wish you every kind of success in that, in determining and defining uh, that very important issue.